almost there. Okay, let's get started. Um, thank, every, thank you all for coming to this afternoon talk. Um, I'd also like to, before, since this is my last talk of the conference, I'd like to thank Mariano and the whole PyCon staff uh, for inviting me here and putting on such a lovely convention. So thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Christoph Pettis. Uh, this talk is about Django under massive loads. Um, I work for a company called PostgreSQL Experts, which is no easier to say in English than it is in any other language. Um, we, you probably guessed that that's that with the logo down there. Um, we also have an applications development practice. We build applications as well as just fixing people's broken databases. Um, we mostly do Django development, uh, mostly because I'm the, um, um, I'm the, uh, because I'm the application development practice there, and I mostly do Django. Um, so this talk is Tales from the Battlefield. Um, we have some clients who have some very, very large Django sites. Um, Discus is a client of ours, as is Instagram. Um, we've collected a lot of wisdom from them. Mostly they did the work, to be honest, but they, uh, they've, they've done a lot of work in building and maintaining large Django sites, and this is a distillation of that wisdom. Um, we've made a lot of these mistakes, and so now you don't have to. Um, there's a selection bias here, of course, which is we're a PostgreSQL shop, um, as you probably guessed from the name. Um, there's a lot of PostgreSQL specific information in this talk for that reason. Uh, most of it applies to other database products too. Some of it will be more, um, some of it will be very Postgres specific. Some of it will be quite generic though. So hopefully it'll be useful for everybody. Um, this talk is mostly aimed at application developers where, who are just getting started at what you hope to be the next big, um, big thing. And you don't want to appear in hacker news in a bad way, um, where there is that site crushed by sudden burst in traffic. Um, when you're mentioned on Slashdot and suddenly your site falls over, crash. So. The first thing is, you'll hear sometimes people will say Django can't scale. Of course, you, eventually you'll hear somebody say everything can't scale. I've never heard a technology where people said, where, where people universally 100% agreed, oh, that one can scale. Um, Django runs some of the busiest sites on the web, um, Discus and Instagram, for example. Um, if it can run those sites, it can run your site. And small optimizations can make a big difference. Sometimes there are huge architectural problems, but most of the time it's not about huge architecture problems. It's about really very specific things you can fix. So the structure of the talk is we're going to talk about some tr tips and tricks. These are mostly things not to do. Um, please ask questions. Um, wave big because there's light in my eyes here. And uh, please disagree with what I'm saying. And now let's start with the very front end, like the browser or the front end servers. This is, the, I'm going to make this easy because people really obsess about this. If you really want to start a war somewhere, bring up Apache versus Nginx, um, and they don't matter. I'm going to categorically state it does not matter. I personally use Nginx a lot because I find it simpler to configure than Apache, but it does not matter. Really, they don't. Once you've fixed everything else in your application stack, go back and worry about how long Apache versus Nginx takes. And the reality is you've never fixed everything else. So just pick one and get over it. Get, a, get on with your life. Okay, in fact, so here's my favorite stack. I run Nginx, Gunicorn, plus Gevent. This Gevent on Gunicorn makes a big difference. And now you have a slide you can show your boss. You know, it's from an expert. See, it says so right down there. <laughs> So the problem is, you know, browsers have, you know, do, do we remember what browsers were like in 1999? I don't. You know, remember when you could turn off JavaScript? I, you know, you can't turn off JavaScript anymore because you basically don't, it's like turning off images was, you know, 10 years ago. You know, you, you just don't see anything anymore. Um, but the reality is some things haven't changed, which is if you look at a breakdown of how long it takes to serve a web request, and first of all, I will, I will note this talk is fairly web-centric. Um, most of it is processing the request after the, the browser has gotten that first byte back. 
it's not actually the time necessary to get that first byte back to the client. Most, if you keep your web pages small, light, and clean, that will make a bigger difference than any other single thing in a very heavily loaded site. If you use HTML boilerplate or Twitter bootstrap, how many people use those? I do. Okay. You know how much junk is in those that you'd never ever use? Like 85% of it. So get, you know, open your editor and start ripping out everything you don't need. It's actually often better to start with zero and build up from those. Um, so they're great and they get you, they get a lot of work done really fast, but they're fairly heavy. Um, and avoid what I call site pestering. It can be, sometime open a big site and look and go to whatever developer menu is in whatever browser you use, in Chrome or Safari or some other browser, and look at all the requests it's doing. It can be pretty horrid. Um, specifically, it'll do like 25 different Java requests, JavaScript requests, because every time the developer thought they needed something new, they added another API call back to the server. And that takes a long time, because each one has that full round trip latency. So do one and get the JSON object back and deal with that. And yes, it means you have to, like if there are five developers, each one has to give up their specific wonderful JavaScript call, which they did better than anyone else ever did. Too bad, we're all grown ups. Just do it. Use a CDN for static content. So if you have images, um, JavaScript fragments, all this stuff, put it in a CDN, which is a content delivery network. Um, Amazon S3 is sometimes used for that. It's, Amazon S3 is only kind of okay for, for an accelerating CDN, but um, Akamai is the best known one of these. Um, I use one called BitGravity that's pretty good, because I have friends who work there. Um, they can really make a big difference. Um, they can significantly improve your overall page load time. Don't use it for dynamic content um, unless you're using, um, the, because the problem is the propagation rates just are not fast enough. Unless it's very, unless it's dynamic, but it's changing like once every 10 or 20 minutes or something like that, then you can do that. Um, if you can afford it, use a caching CDN like Akamai, which actually sits in front of your website and maintains the cache for you. It's sort of like, um, you know, varnish as a service. but. And that, those are great, but they tend to be expensive. So make your choice on that regard. Use a front end cache. Always, 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 always. Nginx or, or Varnish or both. Um, they work slightly different ways. Um, I like Varnish a lot, um, in part because it's sort of like a red meat. It like takes its configuration file and compiles it into C which you then link with the varnish core. I mean, there's something very like, you know, gnawing on the bones about that that I really like. Um, <clears throat> and varnish, you can, it is really hard to crush varnish with requests. It's lib event based, it runs really fast. Um, Nginx does perfectly good caching all by itself, but whatever you do, do use a front end cache. Don't, um, um, actually before I get onto that point, don't run everything through the Django stack. Don't, um, that's, that is the most important thing there. Um, um, on the pages that are cached, remember, don't do a lot of, of JavaScript callbacks unless you must, because you're defeating the whole point of the caching by having to serve up this cache page and then it turns around and hits the server a bunch of times. Um, one thing you can do is use JavaScript and HTML5 for trivial customizations. This is what the, the problem is, one of the worst things that ever happened from a performance point of view on the web is putting someone's last name at the upper right corner of the page. It's a perfectly static page. Nothing changes and it has to say, hello, Christoph. I know who I am. You d you're a computer. You don't really know who I am. Don't fool me. But that breaks the staticness of the whole page. One way you can solve that problem is instead of have, setting a cookie, which defeats caching, um, specific, um, both Nginx and Varnish don't cache pages where a custom cookie is going by, use HTML5 local storage and JavaScript and have a little bit of JavaScript that sucks it out of local storage and drops it in there because people expect that because people are people, whatever. Remember, the, the, using cookies for this defeats the caching. Here is something 
that you can often do as a quick fix, which is your DNS servers. People host their DNS kind of like wherever, you know, usually like the, the registrar for the domain says, oh, we throw in DNS for free, and it is free, which means it is worth exactly what you've paid for it. Um, it can be a surprisingly large contributor to page load time, taking, resolving domain names. I, if you have a high volume site, and you know, if you have a low volume site, this talk is not that important to you, use a specialist DNS service with a with distributed, highly robust DNS. This is especially true if you are running a site that is in any way controversial. And I don't just mean that you're bad people or anything like that, but you're hosting political content or something like that, and you think someone is going to take offense and try and bring you down. Um, Easy DNS is actually very good in this regard for making sure your site stays up when it's actually under attack of some kinds. Um, if you have multiple subdomains on a single page, for example, you've distributed uh, things out over multiple servers and uh, are bringing them together on the same page, a specialist DNS service can be really important. Okay, so now we move to the next, the view. Now we're actually in the server. One of the things that always hurts me personally when I see a Django page is they will build this giant page and every single, they'll have all the sophisticated caching. They'll mark things correctly in, um, with cache blocks, and that's great. They'll have cache fragments and they'll put their cache in Redis or memcached all that. And then every call to the view function retrieves everything they could imagine any view page would render and hands it off to the view page. The result being all they've really accelerated is the template render time, which is the least important part of the whole process. So, let the template drive your data acquisition. And what but I mean by that is, Pat, don't query the database for anything you don't need. Let the template rendering go back into your code and get the data it needs. So, one of the, what the best way of doing this is, use query sets and callables, rather than lists and realized variables. And only pass in those things, and that way, if a template needs something, it'll call the code. Otherwise, <clears throat> excuse me, it will, um, it'll be cached out and it won't actually execute. Cache everything. You know, the, the whole history of computing for the last 50 years has been getting faster performance with accelerate, with speeding up clock rates and caching. It has all, D Django has all sorts of great caching facilities. You can ca cache fragments and little bits and this bit and that bit, use them. Always cache full pages if you can so that Django can just hang, hand back the full page. Or if you can't, because there's a lot of dynamic content, just cache fragments. Always use a memory bash, b b excuse me, memory based cache. Don't cache this stuff in the database. The whole point is to get away from the database. I mean, I love databases, obviously, but you want to minimize the amount of work they have to do. Uh, memcached to your Redis. If it's a pure cache and you don't need, and you're, all you're doing is caching, memcached is faster. I love Redis because it has the, all these really great primitives that you can do. You can do queues and lists and all sorts of neat stuff in Redis. So if you have Redis for something else, like you're running Celery and using it for the task queue, you can use Redis for that too. Remember, query sets are serializable. You can stuff them, you can, you can flatten them and stuff them into a memory-based cache if it's a query that's being done all the time. Store them in an in-memory store. And you know, my further plug on Redis, I don't get a referral fee on Redis, I just love it. Um, and if you just need a flat store though, memory cache D is faster. Make sure it has enough memory too. Um, you do have to worry about the thundering herd problem, hands for people who know what the thundering herd problem is. Okay, the thundering herd problem, which probably has a much better and more interesting name in Spanish, is when, the ca you, you're serving up a web page, and it's fine. And you've said it will expire in 10 minutes. And then it expires in 10 minutes, immediately after which 10,000 people want to load the page. So 10,000 people try to recreate that same page. The solution to the thundering herd problem is uh, start the recalculation process, but set up your application so that it continues to return the stale value. So if this is, for example, a news site, and it takes, you know, 500 milliseconds, say, to regenerate the main page, it's probably okay that everyone get the stale copy that's only a half second old. 
while one process, one process, is recreating it. So for example, you might kick off a celery job to recreate it and then serve up, the, serve up that one. So use the cache expiration as your cue, so to speak, to recreate the page rather than have all, every single request rebuild the cache. Um, consider full pre-rendering, by which I mean creating the entire HTML page and cache it on disk, um, so then, and let the web server serve it directly. Most of the way, most web servers are set up so that they try to hit the, uh, to, to serve the page, and if they can't, it's, um, they redirect the application server. So, standard, the, the, the normal way of configuring Nginx, for example, does this. Or, you can, again, use Nginx or Varnish to do the caching. Varnish is a front-end cache, by the way, that sits in front of Nginx and, pro and hands back static content. Returning large files. Most sites at some point have to return a large file, such you know, download a, a PDF file or something like that. Um, there's a header in, I believe this is Nginx's, yeah, this is Nginx's, which will, um, allows the, the application server to say, please send this file to, to, the, to, the, um, to the browser, but it doesn't involve the application server in returning it. Don't do this. Never hand back a large file directly through the Django stack. Django is terrible, terrible at doing this. Never. If, even if you have to create it and then write it to disk to make that work. This is especially important if you're using Gunicorn. Um, because every, if you're handing back a large file, you've also consumed a worker thread, and you tend not to have a lot of worker threads in Gunicorn. Um, and you can easily starve the site if a bunch of people are all downloading files. So, middleware. The standard Django middleware stack has like nine things, something like that in it, that's probably too much. Um, Remember, every middleware operation runs on every request, whether it needs it or not, both going in and coming back out. Look at what you need and cut them down. Don't use transaction middleware, for example. Control your transactions using decorators or context, or context managers in the, in the new wonderful world of the with statement. Um, I have one that I like because I wrote it um, that you can get there. For, that's a replacement for commit on success. It has a couple of nice features, like it um, handles nested transactions. Um, it fixes a couple of bugs in the Django transaction handling. So take a look at it, see if you like it. It's Postgres only. What you can't pre-calculate, defer. <laughs> so you can don't run asynchronous tasks in your view function. So if you have to go off and request, if you have to, for example, Process a credit card, very common. Don't communicate with the credit card gateway directly in the view function. Because who knows how long it will take you to do that. Credit card processing is one of my favorite things. It can take a long time sometimes to run a credit card request. Or send mail, fetch things from other sites, all these things. Cue those, use Celery. Don't put your Celery tasks in the database, as I've said three times now this this conference. but. Cue them for later processing. Um, if it's a long running synchronous task, cue those too. And generate a best guess result to the user. Um, you can go back to the user and do the spinning thing that everyone does and poll or something like that. Have it sit there with a JavaScript request that runs once in a while so it's nice and lightweight. Um, you know, uh, Facebook would die, a, would die a horrible death if it didn't do this. Because it just, it, it just takes your, whatever you do, it just takes it, creates this really quick HTML page that's like, I think once I update the database, it'll kind of look like this, and hands it back before it's even written the thing into the database, or so I'm told. And it makes sense, look at Facebook's behavior. Okay, so moving down to the next layer, the model layer. Keep models simple and focused. Model objects are really expensive to create in Django. In high volume sites, just creating the models, just instantiating the model objects, even if you don't fill them in with anything, just, you know, model object paren paren, can take time, can take a lot of time. It can actually be a band, a, a, a ultimately be a bottleneck. Um, use natural keys instead of auto field. 
wherever possible so that you don't have to deal with the, seri the, the serial type. Don't be afraid of foreign keys. Um, you know, it, split objects up into the minimum you absolutely must have. And this is one of my pet peeves. Don't have frequently updated singleton rows. Things like counters and that sort of thing in um, as part of a user object or that are system wide. That can cause a huge bottleneck because everything has to write to that same object. Um, people who've heard my other talks are getting kind of bored with my saying this, but it's a really important thing. A single logical object can have what I call both fast and slow sections. For example, a user object could have a field that is when this user signed up. That really doesn't change ever. They could also have a field that is the last time the user clicked on your site. And that changes a lot. Don't put those into the same model object. Like username versus last access time. Separate them into different tables and have a one to one relationship between them. There's a huge class of foreign locking, of foreign key locking issues that vanish once you do this. The other part is when you have the slow section, all your foreign keys should point to the slow section, not the fast section. So for example, in the case of J, um, uh, if, if, for, if you were lucky and all of your fast stuff can be put in user pro, the user profile object in Django, and the, put all your foreign keys to the user object, not to user profile. This is, can be surprising the first time you run into it. The very first time you need a single row, it will fetch the entire database result set. The entire thing. So if you do a, a query, and you get a result set back that potentially could contain two, uh, uh, two and a half million records, even at the first time you iterate over it, even if you don't complete the iteration, you just touch the first one, the, the query will be executed and all 2.5 million rows will come flying back over the wire into the application server. So that kind of defeats this whole lazy evaluation thing. This is true using PsychoPG2 with Postgres. I, don't, I really don't know about the other backends. And this isn't PsychoPG2's fault, by the way. This is basically, this is the wire protocol between the clients and Postgres. So um, make sure your result sets are small. Don't have gigantic result sets. And don't rely on query set slicing to make your result set small. The good news is once you've got this, res um, um, once you've got the query set, and you've iterated over it and it's created these model objects, until you release that query set, it caches them for you. Now the bad news is, of course, it's taking up all that memory. Release them when you're done with them, but if you can, res but if you can store the results, do it. Either serial, even if it's later in the view function or serialize them, so you don't have to execute the query again. Okay, transactions. The default transaction handling just isn't good for high, low sites, high load sites. It creates a lot of noise on the wire and it has very surprising transaction behaviors. Um, if you have interdependent models, which I would say 90% of real life sites do, have, some, have a foreign key sometime, the, the default transaction handling just isn't great for that. If you add the transaction middleware, it's better but unfortunately, it also wraps everything inside a, a transaction, even read-only operations, which after a while gets very tedious because it's issuing all these begin statements that it doesn't have to. Um, and also, that should be messes up. I was typing too fast. If you're using PG Pool 2 or some um, specifically, it totally messes up some nice features of PG Pool 2. So wrap the things that really need to be in transactions in transaction control blocks using, you know, commit on success or exact or whatever. Turn on auto commit. Um, you can use the standard Django decorators, that works fine. Or another plug for mine. Keep transactions short and to the point. Just um, get all the data you need, build it up, and then wham, do your transaction. Don't do a lot of back and forth on transactions. You know, like any good writing, you start as late as you can and you finish early as you can. And never ever rely on Django to clean up transactions for you. Uh, always um, make sure you're using a decorator or a, uh, um, or a context processor. Because if you rely on Django to clean them up for you, you will get transactions in the much to be avoided idle in transaction state. 
and never, ever, ever wait for an asynchronous event with an open transaction, like fetching from another site or doing something like that. You shouldn't be doing those in your view functions anyway, but specifically never do it with a transaction open. Don't iterate over large query sets. Especially when you're doing updates back to the database, use the dot update operation on a query set. Do joins in the database, not in Python, because the database is good at joins, Python not so much. And if you all, you will, if you're writing, running a whole high volume site, you will at some point have to write custom SQL. And that's okay. Django does a great job with it. Okay, moving to the next layer down, let's talk about the database. So databases are your friend. It's there to help you. Don't be afraid of it. Um, keep queries very short and stylized. Um, generally, if you're running a high volume site, in your view functions, you do not want to be doing giant massive joins. What, don't let your users assemble arbitrary queries because there's really no way to optimize an arbitrary query. You can only optimize a specific query with a specific pattern. If you're letting users like build and and or conditions, It'll work, and sometimes you do that, and you know, there are perfectly good applications that do it, but if there are 10,000 people a minute doing that, it's going to be horrible. And sometimes you do not have to de um, denormalize. You do have to denormalize and can get a huge performance boost doing that. Just make sure you're doing this in response to a real problem. Just don't denormalize speculatively because you think it might help. Don't do these things. Don't store web sessions in the database. Use memcache, use Redis, use something else. Don't store your task queue in the database, specifically Celery. Um, specifically, if your task queue manager, like Celery, um, polls the database every 10 milliseconds, very bad. Don't, um, if you have an otherwise transactional database, but you also have very high volume data, like your click stream or something else, separate that out into its own server. Because you will, be, because those two workloads are very incompatible with somebody placing orders and someone taking a click stream. So that's a great opportunity to spin up a separate virtual machine, install a separate database, and have that absorb the click stream data. Never, ever explicitly lock, ever, 100%. Never issue an explicit database lock. If you think you have to, see number one. If you're sure you have to, see number one. There is never a good reason to issue an explicit database lock in Postgres. It is almost always a guarantee of an application problem. Sometimes these application problems are really, really hard to solve and you don't have time and you say, oh, forget it, I'm just gonna do an explicit database lock. I've done that, but I've never said this was the best way to solve the problem. It's just this was the fastest way to solve the problem. If you're running a high volume site, you're going to be running a connection pooler. Um, it has no built in connection pooling. There is, um, Jang there is Django DB pool, which I'm actually not familiar with, so I can't talk to it either way, but it's not part of the core. In Postgres specifically, it can take you longer to connect to the database than it can to process the request. Um, uh, Post I love Postgres, but it does have some flaws. One of them is the connection, um, the time to open a connection is fairly, ex is fairly high, it's fairly expensive. There are two con outside connection poolers, PG Bouncer and PG Pool 2, that are worth talking about. Um, there's also this guy. Again, I, I don't have familiar familiarity with it, but I'll start playing with it. Um, you can use these in either session or transaction mode. Um, if you're using Postgres, use 9.0 um, streaming replication. It's great for web type, uh, uh, web type read versus write, write loads, where you have a lot of, of reads and a fairly small number of writes to the database. But the question is, how do, can you route requests to the right server? Because the, the primary in a replica in Postgres can take writes, but none of the replicas can take writes. They are read only. Well, there are a couple ways of doing it. You can use Django's built-in multi-database feature, which is really nice. It actually works very well with this. Um, when they first rolled out multi-database support in Django, <clears throat> my reaction was, oh my god, this is the most over-engineered thing ever. What would we possibly do with it? And the answer is it fits really nicely with this. It's great, so silly me. Um, if you have more than one secondary, 
you can either use PG Pool 2 or a TCP IP based load balancer like HA proxy. PG Pool 2 in its more recent versions is, has lots of really neat features for replication. It will route queries to the right, rep, to the right um, machine so it can detect whether it's a update operation, a, a data modifying operation, update, insert, whatever, delete. And route it to the primary and route all the, the read only selects the secondaries for you without you having to change your application. That's really nice. Um, if one of the app, if one of the secondaries fails or the primary fails, it will promote a secondary for you um, with a little bit of scripting work on your part. So that's really nice. One thing to remember when you're using replication is replication lag. When you do a write to the primary, the, the, it does take time for the secondaries to pick up the change. The good news is the standard way of writing a Django application, which is you do a bunch of reads and then one write right at the end and then you render the template, tends not, tends to um, not be subject to replication lag because you've done, you don't, where replication lag matters is where you've written to the database and then read expecting the data to be there right away. Django applications generally don't do that, but just be aware of it in yours. So, um, PG Bouncer, it was developed by Skype. Uh, they use, l they have lots and lots of Postgres machines, so if they know, they know about running high volume Postgres sites. It's really fast and lightweight, cheap and cheerful. Um, a single, um, for a single database or a bunch of, or a replication set that you're managing yourself, um, it doesn't do any of the, this cool stuff. It doesn't do failover, it doesn't do load balancing, it doesn't do automatic query routing. But it's really fast and efficient because it doesn't have to do any of that stuff. Your other option is this, uh, is PG Pool 2. Um, it's more sophisticated than PG Bouncer but it's also slower because it has to take queries apart to decide what to do with them. It does all this cool stuff, it does failover, it does query routing. The problem is it doesn't really interact very well with Django's transaction management because anytime it sees a begin statement, it assumes you're going to modify the database and routes it to the primary, which means people will set it up and wonder, hey, why are all my queries going to the primary and nothing going to the secondary? So use, use XACT, <laughs> which fixes this problem. Okay, and a little bit about the system components. Um, most sites have to do some kind of full text search these days. You know, they, they'll, they have the search box you can type anything in to. Um, generally, people just automatically, by reflex, install either Solar or Elasticsearch, which are really great products. Lucene is an amazing piece of code. Um, they can be a lot of work though. I mean, I spend, you know, I'll, setting up a Postgres server takes me minutes and setting up uh, Solar or Elasticsearch takes hours. Um, Postgres has built in full text search and there are Django snippets to, to let you use it. So if you don't absolutely need all of the wild stuff that's in these, you might just want to use the built in one in Postgres and save yourself some work. Um, Postgres this is great, MySQLs exists. Um, and to the extent possible, always pre-calculate the search results. If you um, monitor common ter one thing you can do is monitor the common terms and have, and when you reload the database or update it, have a background process that's pre-calculating these so you don't have to issue the actual query. Um, In-memory databases, so again, memcached is great for a flat in and out store, you get one key space. Um, if you want to do queuing or more advanced operations, for example, you want to use as the background, the backing store for a um, Redis queue, or excuse me, a celery queue, um, Redis is great. Um, both of these products for some reason come with really weird timeout settings. So you want to make sure that um, generally they're, they're very long settings. So you want to make sure that, that you time out faster if you're failing over from one to another. And of course everybody these days is running in the cloud. Um, you have like the entire world's worth of cloud services out there. Um, there's Heroku where you get sort of this thing. It's not a machine. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a service. You know, it's like the wall socket with data coming out, with requests coming out of it into your application. And it's super managed. It's great. Um, you don't have to worry about, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, like a hundred thousand things that you have to worry about if you're running your hardware. On the other one is, you know, something like Linode where you push a button and like, here's your virtual machine, have fun with it. Um, hope, hope you know what you're doing. Um, 
you know, c carefully compare your cost to what you get. And I don't mean that as saying, oh, this is too expensive. Remember that develop your developer time is, is very expensive also, and they probably want to be writing code and not dinking, dinking around with, like, with our syslog D settings, like I spent half a day doing recently. Um, if you are getting thousands upon thousands, at some point you will need some operation staff. You will need operation smart people. This will happen. If you're running on something like Linode, you'll need them right away. If you're running on something like Heroku, you can probably defer them for a long, long time. But at some point you will. The cloud does not cause your operation staff to magically go away. So the good parts, the cloud providers keep the light on, higher touch providers configure and manage your system. Although frankly, I'm never super impressed by these guys, but that maybe that's just me being cranky. Um, w the best part about the cloud is that you can provision and unprovision hardware quickly to manage demand. That's what's really good about that. That is probably that is to me what is the best part about the, uh, about the cloud is when you anticipate demand or want to or um, or are getting demand, you can spin things up quickly. The biggest problem right now is scaling up and down database demand is much harder. That's, um, so you do have to be generous with how you allocate database hardware compared to front end hardware. Um, General, if you're, this is mostly, um, this is not a super managed service like Heroku, but if you have your own stuff. Um, IO performance will generally suck rocks. It'll really be terrible. Um, it generally varies from like pretty bad to like really, really bad. Um, get lots of RAM is my only suggestion here. And um, they also, cloud providers really vary in how, mu and how seriously they take the existence of your particular machine. And, under, and how, how often that particular machine just sort of like magically evaporates. Um, this always, always, always automate deployments and provisioning. Get really familiar with Puppet or Chef or Fabric or whichever you like. I, I'm most familiar with Puppet. Um, really learn those tools. They're great tools. Just pick one and learn it well and use it everywhere. It should be a one button operation to fire up a new web server. It's just, you don't want to, if you're under load or a system fails or things like that, you don't want to be sitting there remembering, oh, let's see, which yum packages do I install and all of that stuff. You want it to be a one button script to get your, so the, in, the, in the perfect world, you type one command and the machinery spins for a while and you have a new load balance web server running your application. Monitor everything. CPU usage, memory usage, disk space, replication lag. Um, if you can afford it, it's not cheap, but I like it a lot. New Relic is a good choice. New Relic is really intended for strategic plan. You know, I find it most useful, at least, for strategic planning, rather than for um, failure, rather than for alerting me to failures. Good old-fashioned Nagios and Ganglia, I like better for those. Um, but one of the nice parts about New Relic is it breaks down in some detail where your application is spending your to its time. Is it in the database? Is it in your stack? Is it in the front end? So it's really nice. But it's not cheap. Okay. Just about every really, really high load crushing site shards in some way. Sharding is a favorite thing. Um, I'm going to talk about database sharding in particular because I'm a database guy. Um, it's dividing database labor o over multiple servers, none of which have the full set of data. So it's breaking your database up into pieces. This is horizontal sharding, and which is, which is most of the time what sharding is these days. And eventually you need to shard, because eventually you will run out, you cannot build a single server powerful enough to handle your traffic, especially if you're running on a cloud host provider. And there's, uh, there are no out of the box, um, solutions for Postgres that will just push a button and cause it to shard, and the ones for other bases don't, other bases don't work. So, um, there is this project Postgres XC that you'll have heard a fair amount about. It's good. Um, it's interesting. It is still kind of an underdevelopment research project yet. I have not seen it in production, and I personally would not push it out into production right away. So right at the moment, sharding is on you, the application developer. Sorry. Um, you can shard by data, sort of by, by customer and by geography. You know, you can put your, um, 
you can put your um, European customers on one server, America's, you know, America's customers on other servers. That's one way of sharding. Um, there's also anonymous sharding. You know, you say, okay, every customer whose last no ID ends in nine goes on the nine server. Um, either way, you have to. There's common data that will have to be pushed out across the whole, about across all the um, the machines, to for um, for efficiency's sake. Some of the challenges that you're going to face in designing a sharding ar architecture: routing queries to the right server. Um, so which, which you, you'll need to come up with a way of efficiently, when a web request comes in, picking which server to query to get the right data. This is one reason anonymous sharding is kind of nice, because, it, you know, for example, you can hash the ID and pick a server on that basis. Um, sometimes you do have to do aggregation across all servers. You know, the, the, you have to do reporting and things like that, that roll up across all, all the servers. Now you have to do queries that span multiple servers. That could be f a fun challenge. And pushing the common data out. If it gets modified on one machine, how do you distribute it out to all the other servers? And of course, spinning up a new shard. Um, the first thing you need to understand when you're going to shard is the growth model of each part of your data. Data grows over time, and, but it doesn't all grow at the same rate. For example, some data grows linearly with user base. Some data grows exponentially with user base. For example, um, a social graph tends to grow, um, does not, tends to be O n squared. Small constant, but O n squared. Or just linear over time. Or it's constant. So linear with users. Um, this is for an application that's not yet sharded, but will be. Isolate the, the models and things like that into Django applications for, la for later migration into shards. Um, if you can, eliminate this stuff. Generally, you don't want to, for example, you might be able to store your um, social graph in vectors, in array types, in, in the customer record rather than as a many-to-many -many table. Um, and constant linear with time, segregate those into applications because those will be, th those are your future common data. Um, generally, you have to encode the sharding identity into primary keys. So you know, so um, Instagram has a blog entry about this, um, of how they do it with using um, ID hashing. Um, when you have to migrate data between shards, for example, you spin up a new shard and you want to push data out across it, that's generally um, uh, tied to your distribution strategy for the keys. And again, figuring out how to push the common data across these multiple servers. And dealing with the lag that will inevitably be created then. And um, you need to figure out how to do data consolidation. I realize this is fairly high level, but you know, in the last third of a 45 minute talk, probably not enough to go over every possible sharding architecture. Feel free to ask me questions. Um, you can do a single consolidation that queries all the shards, the pull model. You have one server that wakes up and queries each one and then consolidates it back home. Or the shards that push data to an aggregation server. Um, th those are both, those are both uh, um, plausible. Largely depends on your load model and how often you're doing this aggregation. Um, generally, I would favor this if that's practical because it, it generally means there's more predictable load on the individual shards. One thing about sharding is you don't want a single point of fail master server, like you don't want every request going through a single server which roots it, because that kind of destroys the whole thing you were just trying to build. Um, generally, you don't want the shards talking to each other directly. Um, for example, doing queries and joins across shards, that one shard talks to another. Um, because for one thing, that makes failures very, very complicated. Each shard should sort of be a mini version of your site. And however, if you think you'll end up in this situation, design your application from sharding when you write your first line of code. It'll make your application cleaner. It will make you really think about your data model. And when it comes to sharding, when it comes time to shard, you'll be a hero because you thought about this in advance. Of course, there'll be some horrible thing you didn't think about that will be the worst thing in, in the world when you do it, but at least you're a little bit ahead of the game. Okay, so uh, yeah, I thought you'd never stop. Um, 
the, the conclusion here is you can run amazingly high volume sites on Django. You don't need to switch to something else. Django is a perfectly good uh, stack for this. The problem is there's really no one trick that says if you throw this switch, Django's fast, as you throw it the other way, it's slow. Um, it's a lot of small things, it's a lot of, and it mostly it's just not doing a lot of bad things. And really it's focusing on keep making sure that each web request does as little as possible. And once you've done that, you can kind of hardware your way out of the rest by building, by uh, improving your hardware performance. And that's that. Questions? Sir. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, well, the 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 most the most interesting thing to think about when designing the app for sharding is how when a re request comes in, how does it get? Because if you think of each shard as kind of its own application stack, you may share some of that infrastructure on the front end. The big question is, how do you route it to the, right, to the right data store? That's the big question. And once you've made that decision, that kind of drives everything else. For example, one, you know, this is, most people don't think of this as sharding, but you know, when you see sites that are, that are sharded geographically, like customers in this region or here, customers in that region, that is effectively a sharding model. It's just, um, you know, it's kind of an old school one. And it's not very automated because it's based on the way your business is um, orchestrated. Um, the way Instagram does it is that they um, roughly, the each user, user ID is hashed into a set of, I think it's 1K or 4K, so 1024, 4096 virtual servers, virtual database servers, and th which are then mapped into the, the actual real database server. And of course, if they ever hit that 1K or 4K, then they're going to be in trouble. But hopefully, that's uh, hopefully, you know. But they've sold to Facebook, so they're done. Um, it's uh, somebody else's problem now. Um, and that way, when they get the user ID, they can pick the server without having to consult anything else by knowing which user is doing the request. So that's another way of approaching. Yeah, but that's sort of anonymous. What I call anonymous sharding because it doesn't. You don't know anything about the user. You just assign them to a server arbitrarily. Somebody else back. Sir. Mm -hmm. Um well what what's um what's the problem when you have to go through all the query sets so you can make some operation and make some changes to that query set? what should we do in that case? Um I, I would to the extent possible I would push it into the database. Um, the, if you have to do, there's, I mean, you, anyone, any smart engineer can come up with an example of something where you absolutely positively have to suck 2.5 million rows into your application and work on them, you know. So, for example, if you're sending a, a, a bulk email, you know, you're sending your nightly newsletter, you know, you kind of have to have all the emails. Um, however, presumably you're not doing this in a view function that's in response to a single web request. That would be kind of crazy. Um, the, to, what you want to do is minimize the amount of data that's coming back from the database. But the amount of data that's coming back from the database is not the same thing as the amount of data the database is working on. So you could, uh, usually you can replace these things with a single update statement, for example, or with a stored procedure that does all the work and then just reports success or whatever back there. Um, and um, uh, there's no magic, of course. If you absolutely, if for some reason you've gotten yourself into the situation that you, that inside of a view function, you absolutely must process 2.5 million rows, that's a tricky problem, you know. And, and the, what I would, what I would say is sort of like, you know, and I understand that, you know, when you're falling off the cliff, being told you shouldn't have made that turn is, is not very helpful, but that's ultimately the answer, is like maybe you need to take a couple steps back and wonder how you got into this situation. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, okay. One thing you can do is instead of passing in the query set, pass in an iterable or a generator, you know, a generator-based iterable, and have it process the query, uh, the query set and return its results back up to the view. So you have, a, you basically you've wrapped the query set in its own bit, bit of code. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah that, so that, that's, one, that's one approach too. Uh, so that, that way the query set itself doesn't get, have to get evaluated inside. Uh, you know, that way the processing can happen um, only if it's necessary. So, and that's extremely common. So that happens all the time. Yeah, sorry, misunderstood your question the first time. Sir. Mm -hmm. um, large file loads. Those are a harder problem, unfortunately. Um, sometimes I step entirely outside the Django stack to do that, and I actually have a little thing over to the side, even a separate, uh, separate piece of code that runs. Um, the big problem with file loads generally is you're consuming a worker thread inside of the, um, in, um, inside the, um, um, Gunicorn or wherever you're using, and it's tying it down in order to process the data. Um, and there, there, um, this is one reason actually that a lot of, and also kind of HTTP based file uploads are kind of broken, you know, it's not the best protocol in the world. Um, this is a reason a lot of sites have switched to using JavaScript based uploaders um, that, that actually do their own upload thing. You know, they'll, they'll chunk the file and send it up you can also find some of those by Googling for them. And they kind of sidestep the HTTP upload pro protocol because, you know, it says, because for example, um, you, it, it's very, it's not easy to get progress from that. It's not as nice to get progress because it has to do a round trip for each progress update and things like that. So um, for those, I'll often like step outside Django entirely and have its own little mini stack if, if file uploads are a big part of it. Um, and um, in, in a high, especially in a high volume site that does that. So I wish there was a better answer, but sending files the other way is, you know, down back to the user is a more straightforward thing using the Excel header or whatever. And yes, there's somebody else. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the, big, the, the biggest question is, if, if you are doing a query that results in 2.5 million rows, you know, I always use 2.5 million as my arbitrary big number, um, don't do that. You know, really decide how much, um, um, if, if, that you should not, you shouldn't be returning query sets of that size. You know, that's the, um, if, you, if you absolutely must, you can switch to raw SQL and use named cursors which don't have this bad characteristic of shipping everything across at the same time. Um, and I actually on my blog, hang on. Um, it does, it, yeah, if you, if you slice, it does add a limit, assuming you slice before you've evaluated the query set to that point. Yeah. Um, but, re um, the, but also remember offset, that it depends on how you do the slice. If you just do the limit, uh, you, you say just do colon, you know, bracket colon 10, you'll only get 10 back, and that's great. If you say bracket 5,000, 5,010 bracket, it, um, the, the, what will happen inside of Postgres is it will take the first 5,000 results and throw them away, and then return you 10. So you'll, that, will, that will burn the database down significantly. Um, the generally where people, where people run into this is in pagination. This is the most common situation. A bit of advice about pagination, don't do pagination that way. And the reason is Google will kill you for doing pagination that way. Google's, the Google bot is written to destroy sites which do that. It, it is, it is vindictive and mean and cruel. Um, uh, one of our clients is a site that provides as a service large forums for really big companies and things like that. Google bot was killing them for exactly this reason, because nobody clicks through to page 8,000 on a discussion. Googlebot does. It wants to see the whole thing, as long as the site's been up. And so they were issuing these queries that were, limit, that were offset 1 million, um, limit 20, and the site was slowly grinding down. Ultimately, we actually had to pre-cache all those old pages. 
um, and so that to keep that from working. Because of course you want them indexed by Google. You know, you don't want to just start like saying no, 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 thank you to them. And of course, other search bots may not be nice the way you know. At least Google hand, you know honors robot.txt and things like that. Not all search engines do. So, um, so the answer is avoid. You know, you my my general rule is a rule of six. Of, of, and more six times six, I try to limit myself to six model objects and, or six query sets, each one of which has about six things in it. And if that sounds like it's very tight and very hard to achieve, you're right, but it's good discipline to think in those terms for high volume sites. There's somebody over here, yes, yes. You mentioned a little bit at the beginning about front end performance. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if your, your experience with the huge clients that you work with, that was the case, and maybe you, you expand a little bit more with which the issues? Well, um, the, there, generally there were things like very heavyweight pages, um, pa or pages that had lots of components that had to be gathered from many points, um, places. Um, Sites that are supported by ads tend to be really, really bad in this regard. Um, I use a plugin called Ghostery on my browser, which either blocks or at least shows me how many different outside sites one page calls. I think the highest I've ever seen is 25. Um, needless to say, this page took a long time to load. Um, very, very big CSS files can be a long, can actually have significant parsing time. Um, frequently, what will happen is these sites will have grow, will be developed by multiple teams and have grown over time, and so they'll be loading like 12 different CSS files because they're loading files for that the entire site might need at some point, of which are like three rules each. Um, it can be very instructive just to turn on um, the timeline in your browser and look to see how long things happen. And you'll notice that what you would expect is there'll be a request, a pause while, you know, it, wanders its way over the internet and back to you. And then this little burst of activity at the end where the, where, the, where the browser renders the page. But that's not what really happens. What happens is really fast that first byte comes back. And then it's doing more requests and things like that. And the whole page load time is, is a lot of in-browser in processing. So it's not universally true of every site, of course. Nothing is, but that's, that's very common. And you certainly want to make sure that's not the problem with your site before you start spending a lot of time like building a sharding architecture to fix the fix the problem. Sir. Yeah, so obviously you don't want to have all these sessions in the database. Mm -hmm. So you move them to the mm -hmm. But now you don't want to log 2.5 million users out because you don't manage that. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about database? You know, well, it depends on what you, um, you can, for example, um, when the user first logs in, make a note to the database so that you can reconstruct it if memcached fails, or you can have redundant memcached or things like that. Um, obviously, there will be times that you need to log session-related things like if you want persistent shopping carts and stuff like that, that you, that you will have to write those to the database. However, it's rarely the case that you want to put the, ba you want to direct Django's base session handling immediately to the database because that's very, very chatty and every request it's doing some kind of redundant database, it's doing a database operation and that's not so good. Anything else? Thank you very much for coming. Oh and um, that's my, t my personal technical blog, I talk about a lot of this stuff there. That's the, my company's blog and that's my Twitter handle. <laughs>